Welcome to a new episode of Leading in the New Reality Life. Carol, Sharon and I are joined by one of our global experts, Alan Ini, who is an expert in creativity and global scenario planning. Welcome, Alan. Thanks for having me. Alan, I'm so glad you're joining us today we, because we will be discussing how leaders can build competitive advantage in the current and very volatile environment. At least in recent memory, I can't remember such a volatile environment. We are looking into a US election. We have vaccines on the way, but it's very uncertain when they will hit the market, the COVID vaccine, and how they will be distributed. We have natural disasters. We have social unrest. We have climate change. So much volatility is going around. And yet, when I read your research, I actually see how leaders can plan for the medium t- from the, for the medium and long term and actually build competitive advantage. How are you thinking about this, Alan? Well, you're right. This is a really challenging moment for all of those reasons you outlined. Massive uncertainty, massive volatility. And the claim I'm making is that to build a competitive advantage, part of it is really an uncertainty advantage. In other words, how can we become better prepared for things that we cannot precisely predict? And what that means, you know, is there is a competitive advantage to be had really in in understanding what the future might bring rather than just focusing on predicting what it will bring. We have plenty of short-term predictions, epidemiology, economics, all the rest of it, but allowing ourselves to also think about the medium term is something that we've done a lot using scenarios. Now, scenarios is not a new tool. It's something that we've done with a lot of clients really on specific topics, future of mobility, future of cyber attacks, future of family planning. But in this environment, we've offered a sort of a shortcut and we've developed some scenarios that are in a sense uh, ready to go and we've called these sort of scenarios for the medium term new realities scenarios so a plural view of given all of these uncertainties swirling around that you mentioned and more around what might the supply chain and consumer confidence and and so many other things look like the role of government and, and climate change and everything we allowed ourselves to intertwine these and come up with four different pictures of what the world might look like. No predictions, but what the world might look like once we are past this short-term crisis. And the power in this is if you take each one and think, wow, if this one were happening, what would I do differently? How would I prepare? What investments would I make? Then you can begin to uh, strengthen your preparations and become more resilient for whatever happens. So here are the four scenarios. The first one is called near miss. And this is a world where, for whatever reason, COVID-19 is no longer a worry. Imagine that. It's a world where, through some combination of vaccine or herd immunity or, or just the virus mutating and fizzling, I don't know, but for some reason, it's no longer an issue. But we are in a world of massive protectionism and nationalism and people saying, well, I just want to go back to the way things were before. So this is a world of sluggish growth, very little globalization, much more regionalized trading patterns, which makes it really, really difficult for developing markets, for starters, and and others as well. We can probably imagine that based on some of the headlines we're seeing at the time and all the rest of it. But now, wipe that from your mind. Imagine a completely different picture. Imagine a world which I'm calling protracted ner- turmoil. And this is one where, frankly, the vaccine and, tr- and treatment are just really, really elusive. We have second waves and third waves of all of this and really quite ineffective government action over time that, that doesn't help us push the economy out of the current state. And so we have a very fractured world, a very localized world. People are retreating from big cities and just uh, forming their own communes if I take it to an extreme. Economic activity overall is way down, GDP down, anger at governments, even anger at big corporations is high because people are saying, how could you let this happen? Imagine a completely different world. Imagine a third one, which we've called stamina and cooperation. And here, the health crisis continues, the vaccine is elusive and so on, but people actually get used to this kind of at-home consumption and virtual world as a result of really powerful government stimulus and support for tech startups, which come up with some really cool and disruptive things well beyond Zoom boxes. And so this is a real world of technological revolution. Governments are really investing in these new health platforms, education platforms, digital platforms. And so for big multinational traditional corporations, 
there's a real need for a digital transformation. And this is the world of the innovative cross-industry startups who have a massive advantage in this type of world. And fourth, imagine a world which we've called top-down prosperity. And this is one where through public and private and global cooperation, we end up with not only a vaccine, but the means to administer it properly. The economy bounces back. And actually this spirit of cooperation leads to continued cooperation on other issues like climate change. You know, all of these natural disasters push us to tackle that one as well. Tackling inequality. This may still be a world that favors the rich and digital over some of these small businesses and less skilled workers. And there may be differences across geographies as well. But overall, this is a world of cooperation. This is a world of uh, still some inequality, but definitely some form of prosperity and, and global cooperation and recovery. So if you can really imagine each of those and allow yourselves to begin to think, what would I do in each of those? Then coming back and thinking about no regret moves, contingent moves, big bet moves, things you want to learn more about is a really powerful exercise in building resilience and strengthening strategy to build a competitive advantage. Carol, how are you seeing this? You know, there's four different scenarios, Alan, you mentioned are uh, very, very uh, interesting. Um, well, you know, from where I sit in China, the leaders showed increasing concerns around uh, the near miss scenario, you know, the one you described as the first one. Uh, not surprisingly, um, uh, you know, here um, the pandemic has been largely under control since April. Uh, the people are back to work, students are back to school, manufacturing the supply chain are back to pre-COVID level capacity or even growing. Even consumption, if we use uh, retail sales as an indicator, has finally turned the corner um, back to positive growth in, uh, in August. Um, so people are more, a little bit more optimistic uh, to see, you know, the pandemic can be uh, controlled. But having said that, at the same time, you know, we see increasing nationalism, protectionism, decreasing global cooperation, uh, trust, uh, you know, the, the trade and non-trade barrier are rising around the globe. Uh, global supply chain are now becoming a more regionally oriented. China and the US are decoupling um, in global institutions are weakening, uh, global cooperation are lacking even for some of the issues uh, most challenging for human race as a whole, you know, like this pandemic, like climate change. So in this environment, um, you know, imagine if I am a CEO of a global pharmaceutical company, what actions should I be taking to prepare, you know, for this scenario uh, in your perspective? And what if uh, we're talking about the global shipping company or global consumer goods player? Yeah, it's a great question, Carol, because I have been engaging with leaders across industries around just these scenarios. And many people look at the newspaper headlines and say, wow, I see us moving in this direction. And if that happened, if we are in this near miss scenario of protectionism, if you're running a pharma company, first of all, you think about your manufacturing footprint in different ways. It's no longer only about the most efficient global footprint as it has been for decades in a sense, but it becomes a question of how can I supply China and the US and other sorts of poles of this in the most effective way possible. I've had leaders actually thinking also about their commercial organization and how can we sell in different environments if we are a European company, if we are a US company, if we are a Chinese pharma company, it means very, very different things. And actually, some corporations have thought about preparing just in case they need to pull the trigger, preparing to split into different players, preparing to spin off in different directions as a result of this, because it's really the regional players that would win. I was working with a shipping player about this and their initial reaction is we don't care about any of these scenarios because in every scenario, people are going to need to eat and wheat is not going to grow everywhere. Therefore, people will still need to ship stuff, which is true up to a point. But once we got into each scenario and began to look at how the actual shipping routes and patterns and volumes would change, okay, yes, maybe their, their, their containers and boats and all the rest are still busy in each scenario, but busy in very, very different ways. And they also began to think about the last mile and how different things would evolve. Whereas in this world as well of near miss, it also becomes a question for retailers of how can we win consumer confidence in each market? It's no longer a question of a global brand 
being a massive asset. It's a question of how can we be seen as the Chinese player in China, the European player in Europe, the American player in the US. And this has really strong implications as well for how you think about your company, your brand, your names, and all the rest of it as well. So some really interesting implications across industries. Alan, in scenario three, which you, you've named optimistic stamina and cooperation, uh, I find it intriguing. Um, so in, in that scenario, you describe a world where digital startups flourish, there's increased digital access, um, people can live remotely and, and work from there. You have digital education, you have digital healthcare. Um, and so it's, it's a little clear the types of companies that in the types of sectors that might benefit from that. But I have a question for you, which is what are the sectors that could not benefit or lose and what should they be doing? Question one. Question two is what about populations? Um, what populations? It's a little clear if you have big digital capabilities and you're in that population, you're a winner. And if you're not, you know, maybe you're not a winner in that scenario. What does that look like to you? Yeah, so you're right. I mean, in this world, there is a continued health crisis, so we all have to stay home, but it's this world of digital revolution, as you said. So on the one hand, um, uh, we, have, we have some growth, we have very little global trade. I mean, the most obvious loser is travel and tourism and some of these sorts of, of uh, uh, sectors. Um, but at the same time, when we think about it, if you are um, a well-educated uh, Western, um, Western individual, you might be thinking, how can I, as a consultant, as a teacher, as a doctor, whatever the case may be, how can I think about delivering myself virtually? You will get the tools for that, and therefore, where do I actually want to live? Why do I have to live near all of my patients or near all of my students or near all of my clients, whatever the case may be? I can go and live in some beautiful thing in the mountains if that's what tickles my fancy, or I can go live in Hawaii on some deserted island. And this has actually had a lot of implications as well. I was speaking with leaders at a home building company who are thinking about what might the new urbanization look like or de-urbanization or 15 minute city as the mayor of Paris calls it. I've been, we've been working with the, the leaders of various uh, local and state governments governments as well in the US to think about how can we be attractive to this kind of virtual worker who might become the norm of the future, at least in this scenario. And so you end up with, with winners and losers in that regard and completely different roles for local and state governments as well. And then when you think about retail, gosh, I mean, the, the sort of Main Street retail in small towns, okay, maybe a little bit, but the traditional mall, the traditional way of shopping has completely evaporated in favor of this at-home consumption. And what does that mean for purveyors of consumer goods, for manufacturers of things? What about drone delivery and all of the last mile delivery sort of thing as well? So a lot of things that would have to be really explored in this type of world as well, and huge implications for individuals. You know, there are some people who would hate this world, the, the, the extroverts who love to go and wander and see people and interact and all the rest of it. But for a lot of people, this is really positive. For for a lot of companies, though, there are massive challenges, even bigger than in some of the other scenarios, which seem much more negative for me as an individual in terms of where do I want to live, but uh, maybe easier for companies to adapt to. Thanks a lot, Alan, and thanks, Carol and Sharon. It's really interesting to discuss these four scenarios and mind-boggling to me that even in this extreme uncertainty, companies can actually plan and even build a competitive advantage. My favorite is in your scenarios is number four, top-down prosperity, even uh, as if you say it might be a bit less likely. I still hope for that one. Thanks a lot. Um, I look forward to seeing you next week.